Hello, and thank you for joining me at the ballet. Today I'm going to be telling the story of a personal favorite of mine, Coppelia, the girl with enamel eyes. Coppelia first opened at the Paris Opera House in May of 1870, with music by Leo de Libe and choreography by Arthur saint leon It starred a young Giuseppina Bazzacci in her first and only leading role as Swanhilda. And as was popular at the time, Eugenie Fioce played the role of Franz in Travesti, or as we would say today, in drag. Though the original run was cut short by the Franco-Prussian War, during which time both saint Leon and the 17-year-old Bazzacci died, Coppelia would go on to be the most performed ballet at the Paris Opera House. In 1884, it gained a new life with a restaging by Marius Petipa for the Royal Ballet of St. Petersburg, a version which most modern revivals emulate. Based on two stories by E.T.A. Hoffman, whose work would serve as inspiration a few years later for The Nutcracker, Coppelia is the story of a wind-up doll and the inventor trying to bring her to life. It was the perfect ballet for the late 1800s, a period many call the Golden Age of Automata. People of the time were fascinated with clockwork automatons, and Paris was teeming with many thriving automaton makers. On top of the topical subject matter, it was also popular for its balance of humor, intrigue, love, and mistaken identity. All of these factors come together to create a timeless classic that is a staple revival for just about every ballet company. If you're looking for a version to watch, I would highly recommend the 2011 recording of the Bolshoi Ballet production, starring Natalia Osipova. As with all of my episodes, I'm going to give a disclaimer that there's no one definitive version of these tales. I've cobbled together the pieces of many versions and added my own embellishments in an attempt to tell my interpretation of this beloved story. Anyway, let's jump right in. Act 1. The Festival Once upon a time, in a small Polish village, with a town square full of bright and cheerful houses, there was one exception. A mysterious building at the end of the square loomed ominous. At least it seemed that way to the villagers, who were never allowed inside, and would hear all sorts of strange noises coming from within. This was the home of Dr. Coppelius an eccentric inventor who hermited himself away in his workshop creating automatons. As our story begins, the doctor is putting the finishing touches on his masterpiece, a lifelike doll to act as the daughter he always wished for, who he names Coppelia. The beautiful doll with porcelain skin, dark hair and curls, and enamel eyes sits in a chair and holds an open book as if lost within its pages. So pleased with the realism he has achieved, the doctor decides to do an experiment. He wants to see if the villagers will believe that his daughter is real, and thus he places her in her chair and wheels her out onto the balcony for all to see. Meanwhile, the rest of the village is waking up. There is an excited buzz in the air, for tomorrow a new bell will arrive for the bell tower. Some productions use a new clock to keep with the clockwork theme, or just have it be the harvest festival, but I like the bell. In celebration, there will be a festival, and the entire village will gather to watch the bell hoisted into place. Since television and the internet are decades away from being invented, this is the most exciting thing that will happen in the lives of many of these villagers, and they are all looking forward to it. One of these early risers full of excitement is Swanilda, a beautiful young woman with dark hair which she keeps in curls. The exact hairstyle and color is different depending on who's playing the role, but the important thing is that she looks strikingly similar to the doll, both wearing what can be interpreted as the popular hairstyle of the day. She rises and looks out her window upon the square peppered with early morning light. 
She is just taking in the picturesque fall foliage when suddenly she spots something odd. A young woman sitting on the balcony of the mysterious doctor's home. Swanhilda decides she must investigate. She heads down to the still deserted square and rushes over to the girl. Trying to get her attention, Swanhilda waves, but the girl does not respond. Odd, but perhaps she's so wrapped up in her book that she didn't notice. Swanhilda then calls out to her, but still there's no response. She tries again and again, but no matter what she does, the girl ignores her. Frustrated and at a loss for how to continue, Swanhilda gives up on trying to talk to her and heads back home. If she's going to be that rude, then it isn't worth her time anyway. All of this is very amusing for Dr. Coppelius, who has been watching it all unfold from his window. The doll clearly fooled her while standing still. Now he needs to see if he can fool someone while she's in full motion. And luckily for the doctor, a new test subject is about to pass by at this very moment. Franz, a handsome youth, is carrying flowers on his way to call on his fiancée, Swanhilda. Yes, that's Swanhilda. But as he enters the square, he notices the girl on the balcony. Seeing her beauty, he becomes enraptured with her and decides he must find out who she is. Momentarily forgetting Swanhilda, he greets Coppelia, attempting to get her attention with a bow. Behind her, the doctor secretly winds up his doll, whose clockwork gears spring to life and her pre-programmed movements begin. She looks up from her book at last, holding it to one side and uses her other hand to blow kisses, seemingly meant for Franz. Excited by the attention from her, Franz returns the flirtation. Pleased with the results of his experiment and becoming increasingly aware that soon it is going to seem odd that the young woman in the window is not talking, Dr. Coppelius walks out onto the balcony giving the overture of telling his daughter it's time to come inside, and brings the doll back into the workshop. But he forgets to fully close the door to the balcony. A fact that Franz notices, but seeing as there isn't more he can do about it now, he remembers the entire reason why he was walking through the square, his fiance. Meanwhile, Swanhilda has been watching her fiance flirting with another woman, and not just any woman, the same one who had just so rudely ignored her friendly salutations but a few minutes earlier. She is furious with him, and as he knocks on her door, she goes outside to give him a piece of her mind. An argument ensues, and Franz swears that it meant nothing, that he was only being polite. Before the fight can come to a conclusion though, they are interrupted by a large group of people entering the square. They are following the Burgomeister, sort of like a mayor, who has come to make an announcement. Relieved by this reprieve, Franz suggests that they go see what's happening, and Swanhilda begrudgingly agrees. Just as everyone is gathering around, there is an explosion in the doctor's workshop, and suddenly the old man comes rushing out in a cloud of smoke, coughing. The villagers gather around, attempting to help him back to his feet but he curtly brushes them aside, insisting that he's fine, and returns to his smoky workshop. All the while mumbling about how he was sure that it would work this time, and something about a book of spells? The commotion only adds to the villagers' curiosity about the man and his mysterious home. But they can't be distracted for too long, with the prospect of tomorrow's festival and the announcement that the Burgomeister has yet to make. He comes with a message from the Lord of the Manor. He tells them that anyone married tomorrow while the first chimes of the new bell are ringing shall surely have a blessed and happy marriage, and that in celebration, the Lord of the Manor is offering a generous dowry to any couples who wed during the festival. Excitement fills the crowd, and Franz has a brilliant idea. Since they were already planning on marrying, he suggests to Swanhilda that they should take the Lord of the Manor up on his generosity and push their wedding up to tomorrow. Still upset, and not ready to let it go that she had just seen him flirting with another woman, Swanhilda is conflicted to say the least. She knows that she loves Franz, but how can she be sure that he really loves her? That's when she remembers an old wives' tale. According to the legend, a sheaf of wheat fresh from the harvest 
can tell you if your love is true. If you hear a rattling when you shake it next to your ear, then the one you love loves you in return. But if the wheat is silent, then your love is unrequited. Luckily for her, it's the harvest season and there's a sheaf of wheat that she can borrow from the baker. Swanhilda shakes the wheat next to her ear, but alas, she hears nothing. Disheartened, she tells Franz that she can't marry him because he doesn't love her. That's ridiculous, he says. Of course he loves her. In hopes of changing her mind, Franz takes the wheat from her and listens to it shake. He tells her that she mustn't be listening right because he hears it rattle. In some productions, she has him listen and he also hears nothing, but for the sake of my story, he hears the rattling. This only serves to make things worse, convincing her that he is instead in love with Capelia. Meanwhile, the villagers are celebrating the news about the dowries with folk dancing. Lots and lots of folk dancing. Swanhilda's friends console her, while Franz tries to convince her that the wheat meant nothing. Finally, she tells him that she needs some space. She'll sleep on it tonight and tell him what her decision is in the morning. They go their separate ways, her friends joining her to help her figure out what she should do, and Franz off on his own to contemplate the predicament at the local tavern. Later that evening, as the sun is beginning to set, Dr. Coppelius decides to call it a day on his tinkerings and go to the tavern for a drink. As he leaves his house, some drunk young men are stumbling through the square, singing and laughing. The doctor locks his door and places his keys in his pocket along with his handkerchief. No sooner has he done so than the men sweep him up into their merriment, twirling him around and throwing their arms around him. Wanting nothing to do with the drunkards, the doctor eventually extricates himself from their grasp, and they continue on without him, singing their song merrily as they go. Out of breath and beginning to sweat from the exertion, Coppelius yanks out his handkerchief to mop off his brow. Unbeknownst to him, his keys come out with it, falling to the ground unnoticed. And he makes his way to the tavern, leaving them behind. As this confrontation is ending, Swanhilda and her friends are making their way back to her house. It just so happens that she sees his keys falling to the ground. She goes to pick them up, intending to return them. But as she holds them in her hand, another idea comes to mind. This is the perfect opportunity. The doctor will surely be at the tavern for a while. Not only can they finally feed their curiosity about the mystery house, but she can confront the young woman who seems to want to come between her and Franz. They can be in and out before he gets back. Her friends, scared of the prospect of going inside, are unsure of this idea, but Swanhilda convinces them to come with her. Safety in numbers, after all. The girls tentatively grab each other's hands and follow her as she unlocks the door and creeps into the house. No sooner have the girls disappeared inside then Dr. Coppelius comes back into the square. Having realized his key was missing, he is frantically patting his pockets and retracing his steps. But when he comes to his front door, his face drops in horror as he sees that it is open. His worst fears are confirmed. Someone is in his house with his precious automatons. He rushes inside, hoping to scare off the intruder before any damage is done. We finish the first act with Franz. Having seen the doctor heading into the tavern, he ran home to grab a ladder. Intent on meeting the young woman he was so enamored with this morning, he decides to sneak in while the doctor is away. If Swanhilda won't forgive him, then maybe he has a chance with Coppelia. As the curtains close, Franz leans to the ladder against the balcony railing and begins to climb, unaware that the doctor has returned and that his fiance has also made her way inside. I always love a cliffhanger ending, and here's no exception. Coppelia's first act leaves you with all the anticipation of the conflict yet to come, and gives you something to talk about during intermission. Anyways, back to the story. 
Act 2. The Deception. The second act takes place in the dimly lit interior of Dr. Coppelius's workshop. As the curtain rises, we see Swanhilda and her friends entering to investigate the puzzling contents of the space. They find themselves in a large room filled with human-like figures dressed in all sorts of different costumes. Each one is completely and eerily motionless. As they cautiously explore, Swanhilda comes across a curtain in the corner of the room. She hesitantly pulls it back, revealing Coppelia, book still in hand as if reading. Startled at the discovery of the very person they were looking for, all of the girls quickly hide from her. Then, upon urging from her friends, Swanhilda approaches the girl and greets her once more. Upon getting no response, she begins to move closer. Perhaps the girl is deaf. She waves her hands in front of her eyes. Still no response. Finally, she reaches out to touch the cold, lifeless arm. And comes to the most delightful realization. This is no person, it's a doll. Showing the other girls, they all look on in amazement. How silly, she thinks. I've been jealous of an automaton this whole time. They all burst into laughter as they think about poor Franz fawning over the thing. In the midst of their merriment, one of the girls backs into one of the other figures in the room. And a doll of a man dressed in traditional Chinese garb, holding a fan, springs to life. Once again, the girls run for cover, only to catch themselves halfway. This one is a doll as well. The workshop is filled with marvelous automatons, dressed to resemble everything from a Spanish flamenco dancer and an Irish step dancer to a harlequin doll and a bearded astrologer in his star-scattered robes. As the girls explore in amazement, Dr. Coppelius returns in a huff. Yelling at the trespassers, the doctor chases the girls out of his house. All of the culprits flee, except for Swanhilda, who, unable to escape with the others, hides herself behind the curtain where Coppelia is kept. The doctor barely has time to collect himself and begin to check on his creations before he hears a noise coming from the balcony. More, he thinks, as the silhouette of a figure comes into view on the balcony, he quickly hides himself, determined to catch the intruder in the act. As he lies in wait, the doctor begins to formulate a plan. This could be the missing ingredient in his spell. Franz, unaware of any of the previous happenings, slowly makes his way through the unlocked balcony door. Cautiously creeping around the workshop, he wonders where the girl could be hiding. Coppelius, staying in his blind spot, creeps up behind Franz. Then, once he's positioned himself between the boy and his escape route, he calls out to him. What are you doing in here? He demands. Startled, Franz turns around and, realizing that he's caught, does the only thing he can think to do. He tells the truth. Begging the old man to forgive him, Franz explains that he has fallen madly in love with the doctor's daughter, and after their brief meeting this morning, he knew he had to meet her. Taken slightly aback, the doctor carefully recalculates his plan. Of course you can meet her, he tells him. But first, we should have a celebratory drink. Here, take a seat, and I will open up the good brandy I've been saving for a special occasion. Relieved that he's not being thrown out, but still on edge, Franz agrees to the drink. He'll need it to calm his nerves anyway. He lowers himself into the chair, anxiously taking in the odd figures in the workshop around him. Meanwhile, the doctor, with his back turned, grabs two glasses, the brandy, and something else sleeping powder. All this time, he has been devising a plan. You see, he believes that with his book of alchemy, he can imbue Coppelia with a soul and bring her to life. I did say that the doctor was a bit eccentric. Uh, maybe I should have gone so far as to say that he's lost touch with reality, for this story takes place in the real world, or as close to the real world as you can get with life-size dolls that one could mistake for a real person. Anyway, Coppelius has decided that the ingredient he was missing for his magic spell is the life force of a real-life person, 
so as he pours the brandy, he slips some sleeping powder into one of the cups. Franz will make the perfect soul donor, turning to face the clueless Franz. Dr. Coppelius hands the boy the laced drink and proposes a toast. To the spirit of youth, he proclaims, as they clink glasses and take a swig of brandy each. The sleeping powder is quite potent, and no sooner has he swallowed it than Franz's head begins to feel heavy. With the room spinning around him, he does the only thing he can and lays his head down on the table, quickly passing out. Thrilled with the success of his plan so far, the doctor quickly checks that Franz is still breathing. It wouldn't do to kill the boy before he has a chance to transfer the soul. Hearing a low snore, he decides that he is safely asleep and goes to get his prized creation. As all of this was happening, Swanhilda has been hiding behind the curtain, listening to every word. So amused by Franz's love for the doll, and unaware of just how unbalanced the old man is, or the full extent of his plan, she comes up with a brilliant idea. She will pretend to be the doll in order to tease her unfaithful fiancé. She quickly undresses the doll, sashing it in a corner, and dresses herself in the costume. She grabs the book and seats herself as the doll had been, and just barely makes it in time as the doctor reaches behind the curtain to wheel the chair out into the workshop. Keeping his eyes on the young man who could wake up at any moment, Coppelius doesn't notice his doll's face is slightly different. Instead, he quickly flips through his magic book, laying it on the floor between the sleeping boy and what he thinks is his doll. He speaks out loud to himself about his plan. Where is it, he asks. Ah yes, here it is. A spell to transfer the soul. I'm sorry, my dear boy, but we all must make sacrifices now and again, and I'm afraid that today is your day. Hearing these ramblings, Swanhilda is growing increasingly nervous for Franz's well-being. Not wanting to set the old man off before she can figure out how to wake Franz, Swanhilda decides to play along for now. The doctor begins to chant his magic spell. With a pulling motion, he attempts to extract the life force and then uses a pushing motion to send it to the doll. Suddenly, Swanhilda pops up, copying the stiff motions she saw the doll doing as she spied on her this morning and blowing a kiss to the doctor. Thrilled that his spell must be working, how else could she move without him winding her up? He continues to chant, imbuing her with a soul. Or so he thinks. Concerned about what will happen to Franz if Coppelius continues to attempt his magic, Swanhilda quickly becomes more fluid and lifelike with her movements. Smiling at the old man, Swanhilda blinks and sweetly says, Father? Much to his delight. As she'd hoped, he completely forgets about poor Franz and rushes to hug his Coppelia. Her trickery having worked, Swanhilda tries to keep him distracted. Hopefully she can find a way to awaken her fiancé, but in the meantime, she plays along. Oh my, what's this? She asks about the flamenco dancing doll, at which point he winds it up and shows her how it moves. What fun! She exclaims, plucking the tambourine from its hand and mimicking the dance. Using this as an opportunity to swing the tambourine across the table, spilling the glass containing the sleeping powder. Oh no, how clumsy of me, she feigns. But before he can get too upset about it, she quickly pulls his focus away by begging him in her sweetest voice to show her another doll's dance. Perhaps this one, she gestures to the Irish dancer. Once again, he obliges his newly awakened daughter, showing her the Irish step dance. Swanhilda once again claps with delight and mimics the motion of the doll. This is perfect. She uses the quick footwork to kick the book, doing her best to destroy the pages that the doctor was reading from. If he can't read his spell, then hopefully he won't harm Franz any further. What are you doing, he shouts, rushing over to his precious book. Taking this opportunity while the doctor is distracted, Swanhilda rushes over to Franz. He had already begun to stir from the noises, but is brought fully awake by Swanhilda shaking him. Quick, she whispers, you have to get out of here. He's trying to kill you. Unsure of exactly what's going on, but having enough sense to do what she says, Franz lets Swanhilda help him to the balcony and out onto the ladder. As he is shakily climbing down, the doctor, having realized that his daughter is helping the young man escape, 
grabs her and pulls her back inside. What do you think you're doing, he demands of her. But all he gets in response is attacks from the thrashing body of the young woman who is demanding that he let her go. Finally slipping out of his grasp, she runs through the workshop, creating mayhem as she runs into dolls, activating them along the way. And at last she makes her way to the corner with the curtain. I'm not your daughter, she declares, throwing the curtain open and revealing the true Coppelia, laying there in a disheveled pile. In her rush to remove the doll's dress and hide it in the corner, Swanelda had destroyed it. Her porcelain skin was cracked, and joints were bent in ways they were not designed to go. The doctor, gasping, rushes to her side. Taking this opportunity, Swanhilda slips out onto the balcony and down the ladder as quickly as her feet will take her. As she climbs down the ladder, all she can hear are the sobs of the old man. And that is where the act ends. The curtains close on the destroyed workshop with the old man clutching his broken creation in his arms. The second act is my favorite part of Coppelia. It incorporates so many ballet tropes, such as wind-up dolls, unfaithful lovers, and mistaken identity. There's an element of humor to it, but the stakes aren't too high, as it's mostly just a prank by some teenagers. But this is not the end of the tale. Coppelia is a three-act ballet, and all will come to a conclusion in the Festival of the Bell in Act 3. Now, I'm going to be honest here, there's not a whole lot that happens plot-wise in the third act. A good portion of the time is filled with different people taking turns dancing in celebration. While I could list off who dances, which dance, in what order, I don't think that serves the story as a whole. So instead, I will give the short and sweet version of how this tale ends. Act 3. The Wedding. The morning dawns, and with it the young women gather at the church to do the waltz of the hours, in honor of the new bell. As the bell is being raised in the chapel, the local priest leads the township in a prayer. Everything is prepared for the handful of young people who have decided to get married and claim the dowries promised by the Lord of the Manor. Who is in attendance, along with the Burgomeister? Swanhilda, having explained everything to him and happy that he's okay, has forgiven Franz for falling for the doctor's trickery with his doll and agreed to marry him. The two stand with the other couples. As the bell tolls its first chime, the priest calls them forward. On their way to the altar, the lord of the manor hands Franz a bag, filled with a few gold pieces. Just as the priest begins the ceremony, Dr. Coppelius pushes his way through the crowd and accuses the young couple of destroying his life's work. Even though she has every right to return his accusations with her own about how he planned to kill Franz, a voice in the back of her head echoes with the cries of the night before. And instead of anger, all she feels is pity. Pity for the lonely old man who is left with nothing. Swanhilda takes the bag from Franz and hands it to the doctor as payment. Before he can grab it though, the lord of the manor steps in. He tells Swanhilda to keep the dowry. Feeling particularly generous today, he instead pulls out another purse, twice the size, and hands it to the doctor. This should be more than enough to cover the damages, he tells him before sending him on his way. Now let us get back to the wedding. Swanhilda and Franz step up to the altar and exchange vows, followed by 20 minutes of thrilling dances that I cannot possibly do justice by listing here. But it culminates in a high-energy pas de deux that lets you know that everyone lives happily ever after. Seriously though, you should watch that Bolshoi recording. The pas between Swanhilda and Franz is danced beautifully, and ends with one of the most exciting moments I've seen in a ballet, where she dives across the stage into his arms. And that's the story of Coppelia. I'm not sure if this tale has much of a moral. Most of the characters are flawed and do some pretty terrible things. But if I had to pick one theme to walk away with, it would probably be, be grateful for what you have. But the thing that gives this show its staying power is the comedy and of course, the amazing music. For early access, access to my notes, and to help me decide what to tackle next, check out my Patreon, linked below. And if you liked this video, please make sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe. 
Thank you for joining me at the ballet, and I hope to see you next time when I tackle another story from the stage. Thank you.